Good morning, Boone's Creek. My name is Heath, and this is our Sunday School lesson for October the 4th. It's a very, very exciting day at Boone's Creek as we reopen our adult Sunday schools today. And I want to say it's good, good to be back together. As I said last week, we're taking the same precautions, social distancing, masks, and making sure that the room is clean before you enter. Now, for those who do not feel comfortable returning, we'll continue to have our Sunday school teaching online. Now, let's jump into the text. Mark 14, 32 through 42, with Jesus praying in Gethsemane before his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. So open your Bibles or turn on the app on your phone and follow along with me as we continue in our series, The Passion. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Then he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into this time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up! Let's get going. See? My betrayer is at hand. I want to be up front with you. There is so much in this text that deals with struggles and pain. I would actually encourage you to read over this, this text several times this weekend and meditate on it. If you know someone who is struggling, this text can be very helpful. I want to focus on three things that can help a person who is struggling. Jesus struggled. Jesus wanted his friends. And Jesus' word teaches us that we live in a war. We don't live at peacetime. The first thing to catch Mark's readers' ears would have been the way in which Jesus approached his situation in Gethsemane. Jesus is distressed, he's agitated, he's grieved. And the words demonstrate and express that Jesus has reached a breaking point. Now, he is foretold three times what's going to happen to him. For example, in Mark 10, 33 through 34, he tells his disciples, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Yet in this moment, even though Jesus knows what will happen to him, he does not act like the Greek philosopher Socrates, who is calm clear up to the end of his execution. Jesus is not like a fearless Jewish martyr that we read about in Maccabees. He is frail. 
he is struggling. He is sorrowful to the point of death. Have you ever felt weak, frail, struggle? I know I have. And when I do, I think I should just get past this. I should just be able to, to push through it. Or I feel guilty not having previously dealt with it. For this reason, I picture God as frustrated and disappointed with me. Why can't I be strong like Jesus? Well, the simple answer is, I'm not God. But in this text, we see an intimate scene where the God-man, Jesus, is struggling with the greatest decision of his life. And what does he do? He throws himself on the ground and begs. He begs that it will not take place. Yet not what I want but what you want. The worst thing imaginable will happen, the crucifixion. And Jesus is bending His will to the Father's will. Jesus' will is that this will pass. The Father's will is that it must occur. Dr. Eugene Boring writes about this very thing. Jesus' prayer is the model for all authentic human prayer, which does not try to bend God's will to our will, but ours to God's. To be truly human is to devote one's life to God, trusting that God's will is ultimately good for us. You might be thinking, what about cancer, the loss of a job, the death of a spouse? I don't know, because I've never faced these issues. I think I would be overwhelmed with sorrow like Jesus. I would beg and beg and beg. But can I trust that God's will is good for me? To be honest, I think this is what I call a Holy Spirit moment. Only the Holy Spirit working inside of me would allow me to be able to say, not my will, but thine be done. The takeaway from Jesus' sorrow is that we can be sorrowful too. You see, we don't need a pep talk. We don't need religious platitudes. What we need to be is authentic with God. We need to be vulnerable with Him. And I want to remind you of something. It's okay to cry. St. Augustine said that tears are the pillow of the soul. The second thing that strikes me is that in his time of need, Jesus wants his close friends, Peter and James and John. These are Jesus' intimate allies. Now, they're the only ones that Jesus took with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. They are the only ones who saw him raise up Jairus' daughter from the dead. They are the ones Jesus needs during this time of anguish. I think it's very important to point out something. In this time of trouble, Jesus needs his friends. The Lord God had already said in Genesis 2.18, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I know, I know this verse refers to a man and a woman in the Garden of Eden. However, I think this applies to Jesus because He's not only fully divine, He is fully human. He expresses a desire for His friends to be with Him. And when you struggle, you need friends. I'm going to admit this is one of the hardest things to do. Call up somebody and tell them that you need comfort from their presence. And would they just listen? And when your friend comes, I hope he or she is like Job's friends who sit with him in silence in chapter 2 of Job. 
And when you are ever charged to be that comforting person for someone, don't be like Job's friends who try to explain Job's suffering from chapter 4 through chapter 37 of Job. Be fully present with the person. You don't have to fix things. Especially if you're a guy, you don't have to fix it. You just need to sit and listen. Be that presence and allow someone to be that presence for you. This was all that Jesus was asking from his friends. But what do Jesus' friends do? They fail him. They could not even be fully present for one hour. This is the third thing to help you when you struggle. Jesus tells them something very interesting when he finds them asleep the first time. Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. I find it interesting that these are the words Jesus uses. Watch and pray. Why? So that you do not fall into temptation. Does that sound vaguely familiar? We find a similar statement in the Lord's model prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If you are struggling, I want to share something that we rarely talk about in the church. We live in a time of war. I think most of us think it's peacetime. However, we are in a spiritual battle that consists of evil spirits, a fallen world, and the remnant of sin that lives in us. Let me give you just five verses from the New Testament that reminds us of the battle we are facing daily. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic power over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh but that divine power to destroy strongholds. And finally, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. As I thought of these five verses, two Tom Hanks movies came to mind. The first is the view that we are in peacetime. Beautiful day in the neighborhood. That's a sweet place to be. The other movie is one of war, saving Private Ryan. Think of that bloody, horrific opening scene. That is closer to the world we live in. However, no one tells us this regularly so I am reminding us today as Christians, we are at war. Now, the second I say we are at war, two misunderstandings can occur, according to C.S. Lewis in the screw tape letters. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. You see, we seem to swing on either side of the pendulum. Too much interest, no interest. What does war look like? Let me give you just a little glimpse. I think Paul David Tripp says it well in the book Lead. I'm not just a leader building the household of faith. 
I'm also a soldier under attack on the battlefield of faith. How many more allies am I going to lose before I begin to take seriously this war that rages around me and in me? I have seen in my own life and witnessed in the lives of other leaders that spiritual pride leaves me exposed to spiritual attack. No leader, including me, is safe in thinking that he is impervious to attack. I want you to get this last sentence. A spiritually healthy leadership community is always watchful and alert to the spiritual dangers of life in a fallen world. When I included myself in these words, they were difficult to swallow. I like to think I'm above pride. I like to think I'm invulnerable. I admit that I usually see the world from Mr. Rogers' chair than from the front lines of Saving Private Ryan. Do I recognize that there are satanic forces do I know that we live in a broken world? Do I recognize that other people are struggling with sin? And do I know deep in my heart that I struggle with sin within? Let's conclude with three applications that connect with the things we have talked about today. First, God has been to Gethsemane. He's not indifferent to pain. He's been agitated, overwhelmed, deeply troubled, or as Hebrews 4.15 puts it, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Second, we need friends we can call in times of trouble. We're not made to be alone. Even Jesus needed allies in His darkest moment. We are simply better together. We must be a church where nobody stands alone. If you are struggling right now, let me give you my phone number. 423-895-5555 Again, 423-895-4090. Or you can email me at Heath Schinelli, H-E-A-T-H-S-C-H-N-E-L-L-E -L -L -E, at boonscreekcc.org. Third, we are at war. If we're able to view the world from this perspective, we might not be surprised when trouble comes knocking. Jesus, Jesus told His disciples, which includes us, in this world, you will have trouble. The world is fallen. It's broken. We are east of Eden. If you're struggling... It's my hope that these three things will give you perspective on your situation. Also, I mentioned that we need fellowship. Today, we've reopened our Sunday schools, and this is a good place to meet people. However, if you need to talk right now, call me at 423-895-4090, or you can email me at Heath Chanelli. H-E-A-T-H, Chanelli, S-C-H-N-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at boonscreekcc.org. Let's pray. God, open our eyes to the world around us. Help us to see the sin in us that needs to be purged. Help us begin to see the bad things that we see on the news are not of you, but of satanic forces. Help us to have close friends, allies, a fellowship that desires to protect. And may we remember that you too cried, not my will, but yours be done. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.